G'day, I'm Paul. So the Ford Escape, it's an SUV that I think a lot of us often forget about, but Ford has finally updated it. It's on a new platform and it is brand new to Australia. And the good news is there is a plug-in hybrid version coming as well. So today we're going to check out the Ford Escape. This right here is the absolute base model. It starts at just under $36,000 and this one here is the front wheel drive. The Ford Escape competes with things like the Toyota RAV4, the Mazda CX-5, the Hyundai Tucson. There are so many competitors in that medium SUV segment, so it is a hotly contested one. Today we're going to do a detailed review of the Ford Escape. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there, or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe, press the bell icon, that's going to tell you every single time we drive cars on new platforms. Hey, I've got some exciting news. You're not limited to just the German rainbow. You've got 11 colours to choose from, and all but blue, black and white are $650 extra. Okay, let's talk about design. So this car shares a platform with the Focus. It's called the C2 platform. So that's why some of the design elements kind of look the same. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. I think the new Focus actually looks quite nice. And, and this design has matured a lot. I think the previous generation of the Escape was quite aggressive looking, quite sporty, whereas this looks slightly more laid back. It's got a more premium appearance now. Look at all this chrome that you get here. Remember, this is the base model as well, and I'm pretty excited by the the amount of features this actually comes with. So I'll run you through those shortly, but in terms of design, I think what they've done here is really cool. And hopefully that also means that we will see like an ST version of the Escape in Australia as well. So have a look at this, it's pretty impressive. You have full LED headlights for the base model. You can get adaptive LED headlights as part of a technology package that adds head up display for an extra thousand dollars, but that lighting setup is actually pretty cool. We've also got LED daytime running lights and down here you've got LED fog lights as well, front and rear parking sensors. We'll run through those later. And around the side here, 18 inch alloy wheels with a 60 profile tire. That's nice and big there as well. So hopefully that means the ride Will be good. I'm a fan of these wheels, nice reflective element on the outside and then dark on the inside. I'm sort of just thinking back now to all the cars we've reviewed in the past sort of few weeks. This is becoming a trend now, the sort of reflective on the outside, dark on the inside. I'll be keen to see your thoughts. Is this something that you think manufacturers should consider doing? Let me know in the comments section below. So wheel arch protectors, only little. They've not gone down the path of Mazda and had them take up that entire side profile, which is good news. Um, indicator built into the wing mirror there. This chrome strip that runs down the side of the car, some roof rails, privacy glass, and if you whip around to the rear. So LED tail lights. Now, if you've seen the Focus, these look quite similar. So again, they're going with that theme of this being a supersized version of the Focus. And I think it actually looks decent. This doesn't feel or look like a base model. They've really gone to that extra effort. And look at this as well. Haven't really seen this before. I know that, you know, bumper bars stick out, but this is kind of interesting. It sort of just sticks all the way out and then falls off. So I don't know that you can sit on that either, but um, yeah, that's an interesting design element. I just wonder why they didn't extend the boot a little bit more so you get more boot space. You've got an escape badge over here. And then this is interesting. So a reverse view camera plus a little washer jet as well to keep it nice and clean. Let me know what your thoughts are on the design. Do you think they've done a good job here with the styling or do you think there's other SUVs in this segment that look better? So we're inside the Ford Escape. Let's start with the key. Here it is here. Traditional Ford key. It hasn't really changed a great deal. You've got unlock, lock, boot. Then on the back, you have the Ford symbol. This is a proximity sensing key. So you just leave that in your pocket, grab the door handle, and then there's a push button start just over here. Now, what about styling? Look, I'm in two minds about this. So it looks good on the surface. It's just a little bit bland. They haven't really broken it up much. You've got sort of dark, 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 all just dark. It'd be nice to see a bit of color here, but on the positive side, look at this. That is the only bit of piano black here. Everything else is this brushed aluminum. And then down here, they've got this contoured plastic. So I'm glad they're moving away from that um, that piano black stuff. Cause it, you know, I've said it a thousand times before. It just marks easily and it, I don't know, it just doesn't really look that good, but designers are obsessed with it. So I'm glad they've gone away with that. Now, in terms of the materials used throughout the cabin, this all feels nice and soft, which is good news. And then on the touch points here on the center armrest, that feels good. And then on the door, 
it's nice and soft as well. So all of those main touch points plus all of these top surfaces feel okay. But how soft are they? Well, we've got our durometer here. We've tested the main surfaces on this car. If you do want to see how it compares to other cars that we've tested, you can use the link in the description below. Oh, also, you've got a soft touch point along here for your knee as well. So that means when you do go for a drive, you can rest it up on there and you won't get fatigued. Okay, what about build quality? Let's do our shake test. It all feels okay. A little bit of movement there, but for the most part, but it all feels okay and no dramas about build quality. Moving on to infotainment, Ford Sync. It is a name that is familiar to a lot of Ford owners, but it's also one of the better infotainment systems on the market. This is an eight inch display. It's Sync 3 and the latest version of Sync 3. It also comes with Ford Pass Connect, which I'll run you through shortly. But let's start off with the screen itself. We have a detailed review of this up here if you do want to watch that. So today's just going to be a brief overview just to give you an idea of exactly what's included. Included. So down the bottom here, you have all your shortcut menus, and then you also have additional buttons beneath the screen as well, which means that you don't have to just rely on the touch screen. You can actually use these to make your way around all the different functions. In terms of radio, you have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio. The only thing I don't like about the digital radio is you have these ensembles and instead of just being able to pick the station that you want, you've got to actually browse the ensembles to find it. So I understand that's how they divide bands for the frequencies of these stations, but to the regular consumer, it's just a little bit confusing having to do all this stuff, especially while you're driving. In terms of the phone connectivity, you have Android Auto and also Apple CarPlay. So I'll show you what Android Auto looks like. It is a full screen integration. It's really nice and sharp and incredibly quick. That looks really cool. Now, keep in mind, both of these are wired systems, so not wireless. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. Another full screen integration, nice and quick as well. Very impressive setup. Okay, now I'll show you what the native navigation looks like. So that's also included. You don't just have to use your smartphone. You can use the inbuilt system. This is also really nice and clear and easy to use. You have a voice recognition system as well. This works great in terms of being able to speak to the car and enter navigation destinations or to call people. But of course, when your smartphone is connected, you can also use that to improve accuracy because it queries the cloud. Now, what about the other functions here of Sync? You have Wi-Fi built into this unit, so you can connect to that. You also have a bunch of other settings to do with the car such as your driver assistance settings, the vehicle settings, how long the lights stay on and that kind of thing. But the thing I want to show you here is Ford Pass Connect. This is what I love about new cars, being able to connect to them. This has now been rolled out on Ranger Everest and they're basically putting it into every single new car that they release into Australia. What is Ford Pass Connect? Well, you use your phone for it and I'll run you through how it works. We'll crack Ford Pass Connect open here. So that's what the main screen looks like. You can see our escape there. You have then the ability to lock and unlock the car remotely and also start the car remotely. When you start the car remotely, you have the option of enabling the climate control system to a set temperature or an auto mode. So if it is hot outside, it'll then crank the air conditioning. If it's cold outside, it will initiate the cooling instead. Then in the vehicle details section, you can see how much fuel you have left, how much range you have left when your next service is due, along with your subscription details. There's another good feature here. It is the map section. So it looks like a standard map setup, but you can shortcut to destinations such as charging, fuel, parking. But then what you can also do is once you've found a destination, send it to the vehicle. So if you're other half's driving and they don't know where they're going, you can send a destination to the car. Or alternatively, if you're walking to the car, you can have the destination ready to go when you hop in. So that is Ford Pass Connect. Let me know in the comments section below, have you bought a new Ford with Ford Pass Connect? Do you find it handy? Is it something that you use a lot? I use my Tesla app literally all the time. So keen to see whether this technology is actually useful for the day-to-day -day driver. Finally, there's a six speaker sound system. And then in terms of connectivity, up the front here, you have one USB-C outlet, one USB-A outlet, a 12 volt socket, a wireless phone charger. So your phone just sits down there, fits a big phone as well. And then in the glove box, you also have another 12 volt outlet. Moving on to safety, you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection. You have blind spot monitoring built into those wing mirrors, a lane departure a warning, a lane departure assistant. You have an auto steering function. So while the radar cruise control, which is another feature, is active, the car will steer on its own. It actually works pretty well. It'll stick within the lanes and guide you around there. 
constantly reminding you to touch the wheel every now and then so you don't just go hands-free entirely. You also have traffic sign recognition. So the numbers come up in the little screen ahead of you and that's picked up by the camera up here. Then finally, in terms of parking, you have front and rear parking sensors. Let's see what the quality of that reverse camera is like. There it is there. Quality is okay. It's not the sharpest camera in the world, but you do have this button up the top here to zoom in if you have a trailer that will make connecting it a little easier. And by the way, this has an 1800 kilogram braked towing capacity. Let's talk practicality and we'll start with storage. So your phone, that can live in the cup holder if you want. You can pop it down there. You've also got the wireless charging pad. There's plenty of room for your phone. Now, what about bottle storage? Well, we thought we'd use a coffee cup here as well to give you an idea of depth of that. Makes it easy to grab, no problems there. And then your bottle can live in there as well. And then you've got a smaller cup holder there. It's also teeth for the bottle. Inside the door, you have a pocket for the bottle and then a tiny bit of storage either side. Center console, you have a little coin tray up the top. It's nice and deep, but it's not huge. You can sort of see the, the bottle takes up all that room, but it's interrupted by that 12 volt outlet. This also slides forward to give you a little bit more comfort. And then glove box, it's nice and deep. Bottle fits into there. You have netting down the side. And finally, sunglasses holder. In terms of other comfort features, you have automatic dual zone climate control. Now, what about the seats? Well, they've got this cloth material on them, and I don't think they look terrible. Uh, they're sort of ribbed down the bottom here as well. The only problem is they're really not comfortable. They've got quite a firm base on them, and they don't really hug you in. So, I don't know, even after a short sort of 30, 45 minute drive, I just found that they weren't very nice to sit in. They're fully manually adjustable, and I just cannot find a position where I'm actually comfortable in there. But steering wheel does sit nicely in the hand, and then all of this stuff is very easy to reach. Okay, we are in the back seat of the Escape. There's actually a fair bit of room here. So you can see I've got decent knee room. I have heaps and heaps of toe room. Headroom is pretty good as well. And that's despite this seat being quite far back for me. So impressive amount of room back here. The thing that I find interesting about this car and modern SUVs as well, and something that I really like, it used to be just that you could lock the rear windows from being operated from the front. Now though, a lot of SUVs are coming with the option of pressing a button so it activates the child lock. There's no more of that situation where the car had to be stopped. You had to manually open the door and then, you know, move the lock with a key to actually prevent children from exiting. So they can all be controlled from the front now, which is great. Now, what about the styling back here? So we don't normally talk about styling in the second row, but I've got to call this out. There is so much plastic back here. This section up the front is nice and soft, but back here, it is just really sort of firm and a little bit nasty. You've got these little indents here that give it that 3D appearance, but I think they could have done a little bit more with that. There's no centre armrest either, so you're sort of just lumped with what you have here. The seats are cloth back here as well with that same ribbed contour. You have map pockets in the back seats, air vents and USB outlets, one USB-C and one USB-A. In terms of bottle storage, because there's no centre armrest, you've only got one slot inside the door with a little bit of room just ahead of it to put odds and ends. You've got ISO fix points on the two outboard seats and then top tether points for all three seats. Okay, moving on to cargo space. So no power tailgate. Uh, you can get one as an option though. Now in terms of cargo space, you have a little over 550 litres here. You'll notice under the cargo floor, you have a space saver spare tyre, plus a couple of other bits and pieces, and then storage room off to the sides, a 12 volt outlet, and then a number of uh, hooks and tie down points as well. I'll show you what it looks like with the bags in there. Let's see if this will fit in long ways. There we go, no dramas at all. This is interesting as well. So unlike a conventional cargo blind, this is like a super lightweight version that you can rip out uh, and then it just sort of clips back in to the top here. I'll show you what this is like with all of our luggage out. So this space expands to just under 1500 litres. Wow, that's got some action to it when you drop these rear seats. Look at this. You lose a finger in there. So there you go, just under 1500 litres of cargo space with those seats dropped. So we've hit the road in the Ford Escape. Under the bonnet is a two litre turbocharged four cylinder petrol engine. Makes 183 kilowatts of power and 387 Newton meters of torque. And that's made into an eight speed automatic transmission. It's actually a really healthy amount of power and torque. It means that this thing feels nice and punchy. And it's always ready to do overtaking and getting away from the traffic lights. Okay, let's see how punchy it is. I'll give it a little kick here. 
Gee, that's actually really good. It's punchy enough to shift everything that we have in the boot. Um, yeah, it really just pins you back in the seat. It feels like a, a sudden rush of energy and torque. It's really good. So this is front wheel drive, so you will get a little bit of torque steer, but it's not an incredibly bad amount. If I give it a little kick here with steering input, it doesn't actually fuss around too much. So it just gets the torque to the ground and away you go. So that feels really good. The gearbox is nice and fast as well. So it's not a torque converter. So you don't have sort of any of the fussiness you do of a dual clutch. Even coming up here, I can just lean on the throttle and it just picks up nicely. So yeah, really impressive engine and gearbox combination. Now, what about zero to 100? Let's put a stopwatch against it and see how we go. Let's talk about fuel economy. So Ford claims 8.6 litres per 100 kilometres on the combined cycle. So it's a little bit higher than a lot of the competitors in this segment. Let's see what we're sitting at. Okay, 9.2, we're actually right near that official claim anyway. So I guess I'd prefer them to be just more honest with the official claim when you're gonna get close to it anyway, instead of them saying it's like five and then us getting nine anyway. The only thing to keep in mind though with that fuel economy is that it requires a minimum 95 Ron premium unleaded. So you will have to pay a little bit extra for fuel each time you fuel up. Let's talk drive mode. So you've got a few to choose from. This button here cycles through them. There's like a litany of them. Normal, eco, sport, uh, slippery, and then deep snow slash sand. Tell you what, if you're stuck in deep snow or sand in a front wheel drive escape, you've probably got a couple more issues than the drive mode you're gonna select. So normal is just normal. Eco is everything a little dulled, less throttle response, but let's dial in sport. I'm actually curious to see what this feels like. Okay, so it's gone back a couple of gears, much sharper throttle response. It's actually a good sounding engine as well. It's sort of, it's not raspy or burbling or anything like that, but it just gives you a little bit of noise inside the cabin. See what it's like through a couple of corners here. Hey, that's actually not too bad. This feels really nice and sporty. It sits nice and flat as we go through corners and things move around. Yeah, look, it's, it's actually not terrible. It's actually far better than I thought it would be. Okay, so one thing I am noticing and really not liking is the steering. It's actually really strange. There's resistance as you turn in, but it's super eager to get back to center. And then about center, it's just really fidgety. It's kind of tuned like a Focus ST instead of like an entry level SUV. It's just, I don't know, not very, yeah, it just doesn't have great communication through the rack. And I feel that they've probably missed an opportunity there with a little bit of extra tuning. Same thing with the brake pedal. It is incredibly sensitive. So when you go for the brakes, they just bite really hard. And even if you just try and modulate it ever so slightly, they just end up sort of biting and throwing you forward. So I think the steering and the brake pedal feel could I don't know, just do with a little bit more work. Now, what about turning circle? So it comes in at 11.4 meters. So it's not exactly going to turn on a dime, but you won't need to be doing three point turns all the time. Now, what about the ride? So I mentioned just before that in terms of sportiness, it feels nice and sporty, but unfortunately that translates to the ride as well. Even though it's got those big chunky tires, it's on the sportier side of comfortable. So I'm just finding as we're driving over some of these little corrugations and, and uh, imperfections in the road, it's really communicating through to the cabin. And you'll notice in and around the city on cobblestones and those surfaces that you find that get washed away, that you're really just noticing everything through the car. So I think again, they, they just could have done a little bit more work on the ride there to just soften it out slightly. So what about road noise? Well, we're on a country road at the moment doing around 100 kilometers an hour. It's actually not too bad in here. There is a little bit of wind noise coming in on those wing mirrors, but for the most part, there isn't a great deal of tire noise coming into the cabin. Let's talk visibility. So I can see really easily out the front there. We can see all the way down to the front of the car. So that is all fine. Out the back, it is okay. The narrow envelope makes it a little tricky to see out of there, but for the most part, it's not too much of a drama. The wing mirrors are a decent size and they also have those blind spot monitors built into them. It means that you won't be merging into other cars on the road anytime soon. Also on the ground clearance front, 191 millimeters is available. It's not a huge amount. You're not gonna be doing any off-roading, especially here in the front wheel drive version. So the Ford Escape, it is sharply priced, it is loaded with tech and features, and it has an incredibly punchy engine as well. But 
it's ultimately let down by some really fidgety steering, a very sensitive brake pedal, and a ride that's probably a little on the sportier side of comfortable. Plus, those seats aren't super comfortable either. So look, I would recommend taking a test drive of this. Get a 24-hour test drive under your belt first. You may prefer the sportier feel of the Escape because the engine is really punchy, and I think if you do want that pace out of your SUV without spending a bucket load of cash, this could be the right one, but it is slightly let down by those other things. So let me know in the comments section below, have you driven the Escape? Did you buy one? Does it get better over time? Let me know what your thoughts are, and if not, what would you be buying instead of this? If you did enjoy this video, make sure you hit like, and don't forget to subscribe, and also press the bell icon, because that's gonna tell you every single time we drive something new. But until next time, take it easy.